It's been too long since I've been a teacher. I've, I have to use my notes or I'm going to get absolutely lost. Uh, so bear with me as I have trouble going through my pages. So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second independent charter school symposium and the first since this organization was actually officially incorporated over a year ago. A bunch of people. A bunch of people who worked very hard to put together a program that we think is really unique among education conferences, but very much in keeping with the innovative, democratic, and progressive spirit of the schools that you folks represent. First of all, thanks to all my new friends from across this beautiful state. We chose New Mexico because the work you're doing is exemplary of what we feel the charter sector was meant to be. And because in a time of great divisiveness, we thought it would be helpful for us all to get grounded in the spirituality that permeates this place. Thanks to the folks at the New Mexico Public Education Department, the PED, um, for your help. One feels that there is a commitment to getting it right, and you're setting a good example of policy rather than politics driving things. Uh, and I also, it's exemplary the fact that in this new administration, uh, uh, someone like Kara Bobroff has risen to Assistant Secretary of Education of the state also is, is indicative of the fact that, uh, that, that there is a, a, a recognition of the work that is being done in the charter movement and a, a recognition of wanting to move forward correctly. Um, thanks to our sponsors and exhibitors, especially to CGM. Uh, we couldn't possibly do this without their support. Uh, thanks to my <clears throat> terrific board, Ricardo Morales, our, our board chair, uh, who's also director of Academia in Los Angeles. Uh, he's here. Ricardo? And our treasurer, uh, Richard Lee, director of Academy of the Charter, uh, director of the Academy of the City Charter School in Queens, New York. Richard, I said, here. Um, big thanks to all our keynote speakers: Joe Nathan, La Nancy Lopez, Sion Proctor, Greg R Richmond, Amy Young. Uh, can't really hear. Can't wait to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, and I need to give a real special shout out to two very young and absolutely indispensable people who poured their hearts into this. So Edward Rivera and Violet Cole, I, you probably ran into them. I mean, we're really such a small organization, but they make us look so good. So it's, uh, you guys are a joy to be, be with. Uh, some announcements. Uh, happy hour is actually tonight from 5 to 5.30 to 7. It's at the Explora Science and Arts Center, and our volunteers from SODA, the School of Dreams Academy, are going to show the way. It's a five minute walk there, so I hope everyone can do it, but once there, we're gonna be entertained by the guitar ensemble, also from the School of Dreams. Uh, SODA people are all over the place. Where are the SODA people? SODA, this is... Um, I wish it could have been on the tour for you guys for tomorrow, but it is about 25 miles south of, south of here, uh, and it's it's just unbelievable what they are accomplishing in uh, you know out out there, 25 miles from Albuquerque in a bunch of trailers painted pastel colors, um, just doing absolutely phenomenal things. Tomorrow this uh, tomorrow afternoon after all of the uh, sessions are done, we're going to hold our annual membership meeting at four. PM in Alvarado A. Uh, we need to elect some new board members, including our first parent member. And the word is that our student activists who are meeting here today are preparing a resolution that they would like our organization to adopt. So in order to vote, you actually have to be a member. To be a member, you have to join online or you fill out one of these cards. A lot of you have, haven't, please, uh, I know it, you're all here, but it's really important that, uh, uh, that you become a member of uh, our organization. I've got most of my props here. Um, it doesn't cost really to join. Dues are optional and suggested dues are very modest, but joining is an act of solidarity, and it's an act of solidarity with the principles that you'll see on the back of your program. These principles were adopted unanimously at our first meeting before we incorporated. It was in Long Island City. 
uh, in the fall of 2017, and uh, a bunch of you folks were there when this was discussed. And if you look at this, I think you'll see what it, what it really is that that's the DNA of this organization uh, and what sets us apart from all other charter or other educational advocacy organizations that, that exist. So if, if this is you, then you must join. And if you join, you can vote. And we're an uber democratically run organization. We need the voices of schools across the country. We started out with only a, with a 150 schools at the end of year one. We have a goal of getting that up to 400 uh, this year. Um, please spread the word. Uh, we also need to have a few board members. So uh, our, by our bylaws require that the majority of our board are leaders or staff of schools, we are governed by our members, not by uh, not by outside uh, outside folks. This organization, honestly, this organization is yours. So, for those of you who wish to help with governance and help uh, with leaders, uh, help us in leadership, uh, please talk to Ricardo or Richard. They'll be at the happy hour. That's a good time to talk. Um, I want to say a little bit more about the student piece in this conference. Um, will all the, the students, uh, every student here please stand? We've got a fair number. All the students. We've got the students from Academia, Avance, Naka. We have, we actually have, we have a whole lot more coming uh, this afternoon. Um, but you don't usually find that many students at educational conferences, but um, this is not going to be your average edu conference. All educational advocacy organizations claim they're doing it for the kids. And yet we presently have two educational advocacy factions engaged in a very ugly war with each other, all in the name of doing it for the kids. So today, we want to turn that cliche on its head. So enough of doing it for the kids until we hear from the students about their expectations from us. There is a student-led session this afternoon from 3 to 4.30 p.m. in the turquoise room, uh, and we're hoping that you, I'm talking to all the students here, you use that time to provide us with guidance about what we must do better. We are in a state of intersecting crises, and young activists are making it clear that the world into which they are maturing is imperiled. It is our obligation to support them in their struggles and to give them the tools they need to become effective advocates. We in the charter sector are supposed to be the innovators. We should be at the vanguard of what is good and right in public education. If we can't lead the way towards an education that is directed towards their struggles, then we are truly cooked, figuratively, and if we believe in science, literally. I've seen our education system rise to confront a similar crisis before, because I came to age in the Midwest during the Sputnik years. When I entered high school in 1960, okay, you can, you can guess my age now, my entire freshman class was introduced to a brand new biology program, which some of you may remember, if you go back that far, called BSCS. It was developed by a government-sponsored think tank in Colorado that and that course, with its paper-bound materials, all in like 12-point courier, looked like it was typed by a bunch of mad scientists. That program lit me up. And I envied the juniors and seniors in our high school who had these brand new physics programs. They were literally going to become rocket scientists. The National Science Foundation was giving summer scholarships, six to eight week intensive science courses at universities across the, uh, the US. This is in the early 60s. And at 15 years old, I found myself on a plane to Mayaguez, Puerto Rico, to study chemistry. Y regresé hablando español como boricua. So, y todavía hablo español como boricua. Uh, it was, uh, you know, an amazing experience that happened at that point in time. So, how, I mean, how fortunate was that? By the end of that decade, the US space program had left the Russians in the dust. And that's what happens when you have leadership and governments, governance that believes in science and a system of schools that is nimble enough to respond. So this was literally the Sputnik moment, a point when people realize that they are threatened and have to put forth a concerted, 
collective effort to meet that challenge. So contrast that with the current response to our climate crisis, where governments systematically and shamelessly discredit science. So, okay, as director of CPEX, I have to watch my step dancing around issues that may be perceived as partisan, uh, but I'll state this bluntly. Science does not have a partisan bent. And if we turn our backs on the evidence-based world, we will blow this Sputnik moment. And we are being told in no uncertain terms by students that they will not let us blow the Sputnik moment. Further to the point, today we're going to hear from Dr. Cyan Proctor about lessons from space in the Antarctic during her, her keynote at lunchtime today. Um, we're so fortunate to have Debbie Meyer here uh, today with us. She and Jane Andreas are holding a, holding a session this afternoon and another one tomorrow afternoon in the fireplace room. These sessions are just for 20 people, so get there early and get a place. And if you don't get a place, Debbie and Jane will be around the entire time, so please say hi to them because uh, they truly are uh, national treasures and they, they have so much to teach us all. Um, I want to share a word that Deb taught me this summer, uh, subsidiarity. And it's a word that comes from Catholic social teaching and it essentially means that in an organization, especially a large, sprawling organization like a school system, decisions should be made as locally as possible by the smallest competent body. So this is in fact a guiding principle behind the idea of chartering. And it's what allows our schools to be nimble and to innovate. Were this principle to work in all our public schools, district and charter, along with policies directed towards the, we'll call the true goals of education that are implicit in our statement of principles, I have no doubt that our gravest challenges would be met. And over the next two days, you'll have the opportunity to see just how innovative and nimble our schools are. We have an entire breakout room devoted to innovation. Jeremy Cavallaro, where are you, Jeremy? He's from uh, Orange County. Uh, Community Roots in Orange County, uh, California. He's probably getting the innovations room ready right now. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Another, another one of our rooms is devoted to service learning projects, another to how we're struggling with issues around diversity, and another to saving the teaching profession because I think we all realize that, that the pipeline of talent is, is, is really uh, is narrow and imperiled. But our schools are nimble. And being self-managed, they control their destiny, but they can't fulfill that promise if they're going to be constrained by narrow accountability measures. And this is where authorization fits in, and I'm glad to say that my friend Greg Richmond uh, is here with us today. He's truly uh, our single best resource on charter authorization, and he's gonna address this in his remarks today. Our schools, however brilliantly conceived, and manage, they cannot fully rise to the challenge if our accountability continues to be driven by a relentless focus on narrow and seriously flawed parameters of success. We don't undervalue the importance of literacy and numeracy, but, but the brilliance of this great experiment that we, our schools are part of cannot be sustained without a change in the way that we are looking at ways of measuring success. And again, as educators, who innovate, we need to take the lead on advocating for and developing the means of measuring what is truly important. This is a big task, but one with a potentially tremendous upside uh, for all publication in all of our schools. If anything, on this conference, I think we may have erred in providing an overabundance of content to choose from at the symposium. So I apologize if this causes distress of forcing people to choose between places you absolutely need to be simultaneously uh, we're learning how to do this, and we want your feedback so that next year we'll do it even better. Thanks, everyone, for coming. We hope you have a great experience here.